Life for the MacArthur children was different in so many ways to so many of the other children in the colony. Theirs was certainly a life of privilege. Their family was one of the wealthiest in the colony. They ate better. They were dressed in finer clothes. They had gardens, their estate, and they had an education. When we look at the early colony, this is a period of great personalities. And perhaps some of the, the greatest personalities came from this family, from the MacArthur's. Today, we're sitting in the drawing room of the house that they built uh, just near Parramatta, um, an estate they called Elizabeth Farm after Elizabeth MacArthur. The house may look extremely spacious today, but people quite often ask where were the number of bedrooms that they needed, because ultimately the family had seven children, four sons and three daughters. John MacArthur himself was a very turbulent figure. Uh, a lot of people know him for his involvement in the development of the wool industry. He was extremely ambitious. He was intending to see his family prosper and to really make something of himself in this new country. The family are special for a number of reasons. They play a central role both in society and in politics. They dine at the governor's table. They're extremely wealthy. They're also an intensely private family. So whereas they have this very dramatic public face, they also have this very private aspect. They close themselves off really behind these four walls and live their lives together. Many children today love visiting Elizabeth Farm because you can run in and out of the main rooms, straight from, say, the dining room, out onto the veranda, from the drawing room here, straight to the veranda here. And you can run around the house and go in and out of all the different doors. It's a little bit difficult to imagine how the MacArthur children knew this house. As for their bedrooms, we're not exactly sure. Certainly, they would have experienced the dining room where they would have had their meals, the drawing room here where they might have played games, possibly even where they had a lot of their education. Unlike many children who may have been growing up in Sydney town, the MacArthur children had a lot of outdoor space to explore. And below here, there were fields leading right down towards the river. So it's very tempting to imagine them exploring the creek, going right down to the waterfront, coming back up, bringing back the things that they'd found to show their mother or their father. When you think of childhood, of course, you think of toys. Now, we don't know a great deal about the kind of toys that the MacArthur children played with. We can certainly make assumptions. Uh, imagine them rolling hoops, playing different kinds of sports, uh, perhaps cricket, uh, cup and ball, skittles, all those kinds of games. In the collection at Camden Park, however, there's a wheeled toy. So an animal on wheels that a child could pull along behind them. You'll see the original in the exhibition today. For many years, it was thought to be a sheep. And you can think that's quite logical. When the children were growing up, they were surrounded by sheep. We're starting to think a bit differently about it now. You can see all the spots and this really definite stripe down the back. Quite possibly it's not a sheep at all, but a chital deer from Northern India. This could have been made in India and brought to the colony. I think one of the many things that fascinates me about this family, and particularly about the second generation, so the children of the MacArthur family, is about their bond and their understanding and their relationship with the landscape. Elizabeth writes about James MacArthur, how he was never happier than when he was off riding by himself through the, through the woodlands and, and exploring the Australian bush. For the daughters, there's a more domestic love of landscape. They love their gardens. They love the landscapes around the house, going for walks, tending the plants, raising the flowers around the house. And I think it's this that gives them this real bond to the Australian landscape. Because one thing we certainly see, and we see recorded in their letters, is that to them, Australia was home. Not Britain, Australia. The circumstances of their childhood, particularly the number of years in which the family was disbanded, they traveled, they were on different sides of the world. But it was at this time that they forged a real very close bond between each other. And I think particularly the bond that we see between James and William and between their sisters comes to the fore when in the late 1820s, the early 1830s, we see their father's physical and mental health deteriorate rapidly. 
Uh, at the end of their father's life, he's actually declared insane and James and William have to confine him. And I think the, the bond that's forged in those childhood years is what gets them through these years of crisis. Thank you.